Lesson 9 Developing a Winning Attitude Sabbath Afternoon August 22 The ministry of Christ was in marked contrast to that of the Jewish elders. Their regard for tradition and formalism had destroyed all real freedom of thought or action. They lived in continual dread of defilement. To avoid contact with the unclean, they kept aloof, not only from the Gentiles, but from the majority of their own people, seeking neither to benefit them nor to win their friendship. By dwelling constantly on these matters, they had dwarfed their minds and narrowed the orbit of their lives. Their example encouraged egotism and intolerance among all classes of the people. Jesus began the work of reformation by coming into close sympathy with humanity. While he showed the greatest reverence for the law of God, he rebuked the pretentious piety of the Pharisees and tried to free the people from the senseless rules that bound them. He was seeking to break down the barriers which separated the different classes of society that he might bring men together as children of one family. His attendance at the marriage feast was designed to be a step toward effecting this. The Desire of Ages, page 150. Jesus came to this world in humility. He was of lowly birth, the majesty of heaven, the king of glory, the commander of all the angel host. He humbled himself to accept humanity, and then he chose a life of poverty and humiliation. He had no opportunities that the poor do not have. Toil, Hardship and privation were a part of every day's experience. Foxes have holes, he said, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Luke chapter 9, verse 58. Jesus did not seek the admiration or the applause of men. He commanded no army. He ruled no earthly kingdom. He did not court the favor of the wealthy and honored of the world. He did not claim a position among the leaders of the nation. He dwelt among the lowly. He set at naught the artificial distinctions of society. The aristocracy of birth, wealth, talent, learning, rank, he ignored. He ate with the publicans and sinners and mingled with the common people, not to become low and earthly with them, but in order by precept and example to present to them right principles and to uplift them from their earthliness and debasement. The Ministry of Healing, page 197. In this our day, the opportunities for coming into contact with men and women of all classes and many nationalities are much greater than in the days of Israel. The thoroughfares of travel have multiplied a thousandfold. Like Christ, the messengers of the Most High today should take their position in these great thoroughfares where they can meet the passing multitudes from all parts of the world. Like Him, hiding self in God, they are to sow the gospel seed, presenting before others the precious truths of Holy Scripture that will take deep root in mind and heart and spring up unto life eternal. Prophets and Kings, pages 73 and 74. Sunday August 23. Receptivity to the Gospel. New methods of evangelism must be introduced. God's people must awake to the necessities of the time in which they are living. God has men whom He will call into His service, men who will not carry forward the work in the lifeless way in which it has been carried forward in the past. In our large cities, the message is to go forth as a lamp that burneth. God will raise up laborers for this work, and His angels will go before them. Let no one hinder these men of God's appointment. Forbid them not. God has given them their work. Let the message be given with so much power that the hearers shall be convinced. Evangelism, page 70. Great wisdom is required in dealing with human minds, even in giving a reason of the hope that is within us. What is the hope of which we are to give a reason? The hope of eternal life through Jesus Christ. You dwell too much upon special ideas and doctrines, and the heart of the unbeliever is not softened. To try to impress him is like striking upon cold iron. 
We are in constant need of wisdom to know when to speak and when to keep silent. But there is always perfect safety in talking of the hope of eternal life. And when the heart is all melted and subdued by the love of Jesus, the inquiry will be, Lord, what must I do to be saved? Evangelism, pages 247 and 248. Christ's message to the Samaritan woman with whom he had talked at Jacob's well had borne fruit. After listening to his words, the woman had gone to the men of the city, saying, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? They went with her, heard Jesus, and believed on him. Anxious to hear more, they begged him to remain. For two days he stayed with them, and many more believed because of his own word. John chapter 4, verses 29 and 41. And when his disciples were driven from Jerusalem, some found in Samaria a safe asylum. The Samaritans welcomed these messengers of the gospel, and the Jewish converts gathered a precious harvest from among those who had once been their bitterest enemies. The Acts of the Apostles, page 106. Christ sought to teach the disciples the truth that in God's kingdom there are no territorial lines, no caste, no aristocracy, that they must go to all nations bearing to them the message of a Savior's love. But not until later did they realize in all its fullness that God hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. Acts chapter 17 verses 26 and 27. The Acts of the Apostles. Page 20. Monday, August 24. An Attitude Adjustment. I entreat the heralds of the gospel of Christ never to become discouraged, never to regard the most hardened sinner as beyond the reach of the grace of God. The one apparently hopeless may accept the truth in the love of it. He who turns the hearts of men as the rivers of water are turned can bring the most selfish, sin-hardened soul to Christ. Is anything too hard for God to do? My word, he declares, shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Isaiah chapter 55 verse 11 Gospel Workers, page 267 Jesus is attractive. He is full of love, mercy, and compassion. He proposes to be our friend, to walk with us through all the rough pathways of life. He says to us, I am the Lord thy God. Walk with me, and I will fill thy path with light. Jesus, the majesty of heaven, proposes to elevate to companionship with himself those who come to him with their burdens, their weaknesses, and their cares. He will count them as his children and finally give them an inheritance of more value than the empires of kings, a crown of glory richer than has ever decked the brow of the most exalted earthly monarch. Lift Him Up, page 98 Christ knew this Canaanite woman's situation. He knew that she was longing to see him, and he placed himself in her path. By ministering to her sorrow, he could give a living representation of the lesson he designed to teach. For this he had brought his disciples into this region. He desired them to see the ignorance existing in cities and villages close to the land of Israel. The people who had been given every opportunity to understand the truth were without a knowledge of the needs of those around them. No effort was made to help souls in darkness. He received this representative of a despised race as the Jews would have done. In this he designed that his disciples should be impressed with the cold and heartless manner in which the Jews would treat such a case. The Desire of Ages, page 400 The work of Mary was just the lesson the disciples needed to show them that the expression of their love for him would be pleasing to Christ. He had been everything to them, and they did not realize that soon they would be deprived of his presence, that soon they could offer him no token of their gratitude for his great love. 
the loneliness of Christ, separated from the heavenly courts, living the life of humanity, was never understood or appreciated by the disciples as it should have been. Later they no longer cast blame upon Mary, but upon themselves. Oh, if they could have taken back their censuring, their presenting the poor as more worthy of the gift than was Christ. They felt the reproof keenly as they took from the cross the bruised body of their Lord. Conflict and Courage, page 307. Tuesday, August 25. Presenting the Truth in Love The Church of Christ is God's appointed agency for the salvation of men. Its mission is to carry the gospel to the world, and the obligation rests upon all Christians. Everyone, to the extent of his talent and opportunity, is to fulfill the Savior's commission. The love of Christ, revealed to us, makes us debtors to all who know him not. God has given us light, not for ourselves alone, but to shed upon them. We need not go to heathen lands or even leave the narrow circle of the home, if it is there that our duty lies, in order to work for Christ. We can do this in the home circle, in the church, among those with whom we associate, and with whom we do business. The greater part of our Savior's life on earth was spent in patient toil in the carpenter's shop at Nazareth. Ministering angels attended the Lord of life as he walked side by side with peasants and laborers, unrecognized and unhonored. He was as faithfully fulfilling his mission while working at his humble trade as when he healed the sick or walked upon the storm-tossed waves of Galilee. So in the humblest duties and lowliest positions of life, we may walk and work with Jesus. Steps to Christ, pages 81 and 82. In his second letter to the Thessalonians, Paul sought to correct their misunderstanding of his teaching and to set before them his true position. He again expressed his confidence in their integrity and his gratitude that their faith was strong and that their love abounded for one another and for the cause of their master. He told them that he presented them to other churches as an example of the patient, persevering faith that bravely withstands persecution and tribulation, and he carried their minds forward to the time of the second coming of Christ, when the people of God shall rest from all their cares and perplexities. The Acts of the Apostles, page 264. Christ calls upon us to labor patiently and perseveringly for the thousands perishing in their sins, scattered in all lands like wrecks on a desert shore. Those who share in Christ's glory must share also in His ministry, helping the weak, the wretched, and the despondent. Let those who take up this work make the life of Christ their constant study. Let them be intensely in earnest, using every capability in the Lord's service. Precious results will follow sincere, unselfish effort. From the great teacher, the workers will receive the highest of all education. But those who do not impart the light they have received will one day realize that they have sustained a fearful loss. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 9, pages 31 and 32. Wednesday, August 26. The Foundation of Acceptance Even in the corrupt condition in which the society of today is, there are souls capable of better things, souls represented by Christ under the symbol of the lost pearl. Christ gave up everything that he might seek and save that which was lost, that he might recover the pearl that he valued at infinite cost. What are we ready to do to cooperate with him in this work? What sacrifice are we ready to make? When we consider that Christ died for the ungodly while they were yet sinners, we are led to realize how willing and even anxious he is to bless us that we may be a blessing to others. Lift him up, page 353. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, 
because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him, and he in us, because he hath given us of his Spirit. This is the very work which the Lord designs that the message he has given his servant shall perform in the heart and mind of every human agent. It is the perpetual life of the church to love God supremely and to love others as they love themselves. Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, pages 94 and 95. God's word is our standard, but how far have his professed people departed from it? Our religious faith must be not only theoretical, but practical. Pure and undefiled religion will not allow us to trample upon the rights of the least of God's creatures, much less of the members of his body and the members of our own family. God is love, and whoso dwelleth in him dwelleth in love. The influence of worldly selfishness, which is carried about by some like a cloud, chilling the very atmosphere that others breathe, causes sickness of soul and frequently chills to death. The religion of Christ is something more than talk. The righteousness of Christ consists in right actions and good works from pure, unselfish motives. Outside righteousness, while the inward adorning is wanting, will be of no avail. If we have not the light and love of God, we are not his children. If we gather not with Christ, we scatter abroad. We all have an influence, and that influence is telling upon the destiny of others for their present and future good, or for their eternal loss. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 3, pages 528 and 529. Thursday, August 27. Truth Lovingly Presented Summoning Timothy before the bar of God, Paul bids him preach the word, not the sayings and customs of men, to be ready to witness for God whenever opportunity should present itself, before large congregations and private circles, by the way and at the fireside, to friends and to enemies, whether in safety or exposed to hardship and peril, reproach and loss. Fearing that Timothy's mild, yielding disposition might lead him to shun an essential part of his work, Paul exhorted him to be faithful in reproving sin and even to rebuke with sharpness those who were guilty of gross evils. Yet he was to do this with all long-suffering and doctrine. He was to reveal the patience and love of Christ, explaining and enforcing his reproofs by the truths of the word. To hate and reprove sin, and at the same time to show pity and tenderness for the sinner, is a difficult achievement. The more earnest our own efforts to attain to holiness of heart and life, the more acute will be our perception of sin, and the more decided our disapproval of it. We must guard against undue severity toward the wrongdoer, but we must also be careful not to lose sight of the exceeding sinfulness of sin. There is need of showing Christ-like patience and love for the erring one, but there is also danger of showing so great toleration for his error that he will look upon himself as undeserving of reproof and will reject it as uncalled for and unjust. Gospel Workers, pages 30 and 31. In the parable, the first laborers agreed to work for a stipulated sum, and they received the amount specified, nothing more. Those later hired believed the master's promise, whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. They showed their confidence in him by asking no question in regard to wages. They trusted to his justice and equity. They were rewarded, not according to the amount of their labor, but according to the generosity of his purpose. So God desires us to trust in him who justifieth the ungodly. His reward is given not according to our merit, but according to his own purpose, which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
Ephesians chapter 3, verse 11. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. Titus chapter 3, verse 5. And for those who trust in him, he will do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Christ's Object Lessons, page 397. While we were yet unloving and unlovely in character, hateful and hating one another, our Heavenly Father had mercy on us. After that the kindness and love of God, our Savior toward man, appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Titus chapter 3, verses 3 to 5. His love received will make us in like manner kind and tender, not merely toward those who please us, but to the most faulty and erring and sinful. The children of God are those who are partakers of his nature. It is not earthly rank, nor birth, nor nationality, nor religious privilege which proves that we are members of the family of God. It is love, a love that embraces all humanity. Even sinners whose hearts are not utterly closed to God's Spirit will respond to kindness. While they may give hate for hate, they will also give love for love. But it is only the Spirit of God that gives love for hatred. To be kind to the unthankful and to the evil, to do good hoping for nothing again, is the insignia of the royalty of heaven, the sure token by which the children of the highest reveal their high estate. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, page 75. For further reading, Evangelism, Relation of Activity to Spirituality, page 356, and Our High Calling, Who is My Neighbor, page 184.